Isn't it wonderful that Washington is, actually seems on top of this? <laughs> Imagine that. Um, our, our next presenter is Benjamin Losky, who is, um, you talk about the powers of the states. Well, he, he's walking in the door right now. Uh, Benjamin is New York State's first superintendent of financial services. He is New York's top financial regulator. Benjamin led Governor Andrew Cuomo's initiative to make the Department of Financial Services. And the department supervises approximately 4,400 organizations with assets of $6.2 trillion. So Benjamin, what's the state of play? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, first of all, to Future Tense and the New America Foundation for having me. It's great to be with all of you. Um, this is obviously a very, very well-timed event uh, for a number of reasons. As you may know, uh, the New York Department of Financial Services, DFS, where I work, um, uh, held hearings uh, recently um, uh, after we held an extensive, uh, did an extensive amount of work investigating and looking at uh, virtual currencies and Bitcoin. So as far as I'm concerned, this is uh, perfectly timed. Uh, there's obviously a lot going on as well in the virtual currency world. I think even, believe it or not, as I speak, if you're watching your, uh, your Twitter feeds, um, I think today's event really represents a great opportunity to share some of what uh, we've learned at DFS and give you a little bit of information about um, uh, our initial thoughts at the Department of Financial Services on the um, path forward for regulation. Um, I'm going to try and speak quickly today, and I hope that's okay with you, because I, what I'd like to do is have time at the end to take questions, uh, which I'll either answer or dodge, depending uh, on the question. But uh, I do like to always have uh, more of a dialogue than a monologue. Um, you know, one of the first questions we get asked at DFS when it comes to virtual currency, and I am guessing the last panel may have alluded at least to this issue, is um, why is a little old state regulator worrying about this? Why isn't this a big national issue or a big international issue? What are you, Mr. State Regulator, uh, doing uh, working on this? And I think that's a fair question, but let me just tell you a little background about DFS, first of all, because some of you may not know who we are exactly. Uh, Governor Cuomo created our agency about three years ago, and we emerged to previously uh, existing agencies, the New York State Banking Department, which was created in 1851, and the New York State Insurance Department, which was created in 1859. So while we're new, we're also old. Um, as a new unified modern financial regulator, we obviously strive to adjust and adapt to uh, you know, a constantly evolving and changing uh, financial world. And while I don't think anyone would call virtual currency uh, a systemic risk uh, any, anytime soon, it does represent a good example of the necessity of innovation, not only in the technological sphere, but also in uh, the financial regulatory sphere. And I think DFS, uh, as we strive to be a modern financial innovative regulator that's different than other regulators, um, we feel that uh, we're well attuned to uh, take a leading role uh, with other regulators in working on how we effectively regulate virtual currencies. Um, in addition, DFS, like other state financial regulators, is responsible for the oversight of what are called money transmitters. And if you're not familiar with that term, think of uh, big entities like Western Union and MoneyGram. Indeed, when people say the word money transmission, they usually think, uh, if they think of anything at all, they think of firms that were formed more than 150 years ago when we were still, our country was still exploring the Western frontier. But I seriously doubt, um, and I seriously doubt, the people who wrote those statutes relating to money transmission ever contemplated the notion of the Internet, let alone cryptocurrencies, let alone cryptocurrencies based on an Internet mem featuring a dog. But nonetheless, DFS, I'm glad some of you get that joke. Uh, nonetheless, DFS has serious concerns that certain virtual currency firms may be engaging in money transmission, 
which would mean that our department has a specific legal responsibility to license, examine, and regulate those firms if they're offering their services in New York. So uh, it's sort of a long-winded answer to why uh, DFS is uh, deeply involved in the regulation, potentially, um, of virtual currencies. Moreover, there have been serious and documented concerns, which I'll discuss in greater detail in a minute, about the use of virtual currencies for illicit activity and money laundering. As such, in August of 2013, our department launched an extensive inquiry into the appropriate regulatory guardrails uh, that should be put in place for virtual currency firms. Now, over the last six months, we've had dozens and dozens of meetings with a wide range of industry participants. We've spoken to leading academics, to law enforcement, to investors, and we've reviewed thousands of pages of documents, reports, and other materials. And after doing that work, um, we thought it made a lot of sense to hold public hearings. Um, and those hearings, as I mentioned, took place about two weeks ago on January 28th and 29th um, in New York City. I recognize some of the, I some of the faces uh, here today uh, in the crowd from those hearings. Um, now, the goal of those hearings was to provide a 360-degree view uh, of this new and constantly evolving industry, both its promises and its potential pitfalls. We sought to bring together a wide, diverse group of uh, witnesses with an array of different perspectives, law enforcement, regulators, um, of course, but we also wanted to hear from investors, technologists, merchants, and a number of other interesting individuals um, who are on the ground floor of this fledgling industry. Now, those hearings, I think, serve two important purposes in moving our regulatory efforts forward. First, they provided us with a very good opportunity to convene and question some of the leading figures in the virtual currency and law enforcement community. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, I can tell you that was extraordinarily helpful in thinking through many of the complicated issues we face. But second, and perhaps even more importantly, the hearings also generated a significant amount of additional public discussion surrounding the subject of how to regulate this new financial technology. At DFS, we try to approach emerging issues in financial regulation, such as virtual currencies, with a healthy dose of humility. We re recognize very much that we do not have any kind of monopoly on the truth, and innovation uh, is constant, and that the playing field, especially with respect to things like virtual currencies, um, is constantly, um, is the playing field is still experimental and still shaking out. Now, ultimately, despite all that, it's our expectation that the information we've gathered in our fact-finding effort will allow us to put forward, during the course of 2014, a proposed regulatory framework for virtual currency firms operating in New York. I believe um, we'd be the first state to do that. But clearly, when it comes to virtual currencies, um, regulators are in new and uncharted waters. And when we move forward, we want to make sure that we have heard a broad range of voices and the, that we are armed with the most forward-looking thinking. Uh, to that end, you'll be interested to know, we streamed the hearing on our agency's website, the two days of hearings, and more than 14,000 people from 107, 117 countries tuned in. Um, less than half of those people um, were in the United States. Um, it probably won't surprise you to learn that that's not the typical audience we get for hearings at DFS. <laughs> And if you're really interested, if you had the, I, we had a, a pool, I, I made people guess in my office what country besides the U.S. had the largest uh, number of uh, people watching the hearings. Um, it happened to be China. Now, it was, it was very heartening to us, and this is an important point, that the hearings produced a number of very thoughtful blogs, articles, op-eds, and other posts from people who weren't in the room which discuss the path forward on virtual currency regulation. I can tell you we typically, at least I typically, try not to worry too much about what the press says. Um, we do what we do because we think it's right and the press will cover it the way they want to. But in that case, having those blogs and articles and op-eds and even tweets at us uh, were, were, were very helpful because we face a very challenging, uh, interesting task. We have to determine the appropriate licensing, examination, and collateral requirements for the virtual currency industry. And in doing so, our objective is to provide appropriate guardrails to protect consumers and root out money laundering 
without stifling beneficial innovation. And that is a tough balance to strike, but we're trying to proceed in a careful and thoughtful manner. Now, I'll be honest, it's hard to say precisely what the future holds for virtual currency and its associated technology. Currently, there is not widespread adoption of virtual currencies among the general public, and some doubt whether there ever will be. The recent issues we saw as recently as yesterday with Mt. Gox and over the weekend, for example, have prompted some financial commentators to write Bitcoin's obituary or to at least question the viability and reliability behind virtual currency technology. But I think there is, at the very least, a kernel of something here that will have a profound impact on the future of payments technology and our financial system. Now, let me add, though, that regulators are certainly not the experts on these matters, but my gut is that this is likely. And that's why we want to proceed in a careful and thoughtful manner. With that in mind, let me share with you some of our takeaways uh, from our hearings. At DFS, we're increasingly coming to the conclusion that simply applying our existing money transmission regulations to virtual currency firms will not be sufficient. As we've noted previously, certain aspects of virtual currency do not fit neatly into the traditional categories we think of in financial regulation. We're used to talking about things like banking and insurance. Um, in many ways with virtual currencies, uh, it's neither fish nor fowl. Um, we do not, we think, have to throw out all of our existing rules for money transmitters or banks, which have generally served consumers well when rig rigorously enforced. Indeed, certain aspects of virtual currency could dovetail with existing regulations. That said, our agency will likely have to proceed with issuing some form of specially tailored license, a bit license, let's call it, that adapts those rules to the world of virtual currency. As with most regulatory endeavors, however, the devil will be in the details. To that point, let me outline a few of the questions we're grappling with right now when it comes to crafting a specially tailored uh, bit license uh, and all its attendant requirements. We have some initial thoughts on these matters, but given the open source nature of virtual currency technology, it seems appropriate for us to outline some of the issues we're considering publicly at an early stage in the hopes of spurring additional public de debate. Uh, think of it as uh, open source code regulation. My hope is that we'll see another round of blogs, articles, and posts discussing the questions I'm about to po pose. Let me start with consumer education and disclosures. It seems uh, fairly clear to us that a strong set of specially tailored model consumer disclosure rules should be required of vir virtual currency firms. There are, of course, potential risks for consumers associated with many different types of financial products, not just virtual currencies. But let's, fa let's face it, cryptocurrencies are unlike pretty much anything an average consumer has ever used before. Right now, for the most part, it appears that Bitcoin and other virtual currencies are primarily the province of sophisticated, technology-savvy, early adopters. If virtual currencies ultimately garner wider adoption among the general public, it will be important for consumers to be armed with the information they need to make the financial choices that are best for them. For example, consumers should be aware that many virtual currencies do not provide for chargebacks, meaning that transactions are, for the most part, irreversible. In other words, there's generally no money-back guarantee when it comes to cryptocurrencies. Consumers should also be warned about the importance of keeping their private keys, just that, private, as well as the potential consequences if they fail to do so. Given the irreversibility of most transactions, if a consumer has their private key stolen, they could potentially lose their virtual currency irretrievably. Moreover, consumers should be informed upfront about the documented volatility of virtual currency and the potential for loss of dollar-denominated principal if they hold on to that virtual currency for an extended period of time. This is something, uh, of course, that most mutual funds do right now. Those are just a few examples of potential consumer disclosures for virtual currency firms. There are, of course, others that could be crafted, but the broader concept is what's important. We found in other areas of the financial world that strong, clear, concise disclosures are critical to earning the long-term trust and confidence of consumers and protecting those consumers. And virtual currency should be no exception. Now, I think enhanced disclosure requirements, I hope, are likely something most people can agree on. 
But there are some other more challenging questions that we have to address, including capital, collateral, net worth, and investment requirements. Traditional money transmitters and banks, uh, you may or may not know, have to abide by certain net worth permissible investment requirement and permissible investment requirements to help ensure that they are operating in a safe and sound manner. They, for example, need to have a large enough cap need to have large enough capital buffers on their balance sheets to absorb unexpected losses and financial shocks without going under. They are also limited in the types of investments they can hold, so they are not taking reckless risks with, consumer, with customer money in the search of windfall profits. Virtual currency firms should abide by similar requirements. But the really tricky question for regulators is how we structure those type of rules in light of the fact that the funds these firms hold are not denominated in dollars or other forms of uh, traditional fiat currency. Moreover, that issue is further complicated by the fact that the value of virtual currencies relative to, tr to traditional currencies can fluctuate significantly on a day-by-day -day basis, or if not even on an hourly basis. Now, we need to consider questions like whether we have to create a new yardstick for measuring how well capitalized the firms we regulate are, or whether virtual currencies themselves should be allowed, virtual currencies themselves should be allowed as permissible investments. Net worth, capital, and per permissible investment requirements are among the most important consumer protection requirements we can put in place as regulators. We've seen instances where exchanges and other virtual currency firms have frozen redemptions for extended period of periods of time, um, which can be very damaging to consumer confidence. The long-term strength of the virtual currency industry will require robust safety and soundness requirements so customers have faith that their money won't get caught in a virtual black hole. And if we get those rules right, perhaps we can make New York, uh, I have a particular interest in New York, but other places in the United States, uh, a magnet for legitimate, well-regarded exchanges and other virtual currency firms. We heard over and over at our hearings two weeks ago that all the exchanges were overseas. And to the extent we can put the kind of rules in place that attract exchanges to really uh, hub here in the U.S., I think that can only be uh, for the betterment. Now, another issue we heard a lot of testimony about at the hearing from both partic participants in the industry and law enforcement is the importance of the public ledgers for Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrencies. Many, though not all, virtual currencies have open, publicly accessible ledgers on the Internet. And in an ideal world, setting aside the recent issue with Mt. Gox, those ledgers record essentially every single transaction that has occurred in a specific virtual currency since it came into being. The well most well-known example, of course, is the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, in this way, some people posit that it is more appropriate to think of many virtual currencies as uh, pseudonymous, pseudonymous uh, rather than anonymous. I'm having trouble with that word. A regulator may not immediately know what person is associated with every single transaction, but they can see every transaction, which can be important for law enforcement in spotting red flags for further investigation. And when coupled with appropriate know your customer requirements for virtual currency firms, public ledgers can help mitigate some of the documented concerns related to money laundering uh, and this new technology. The question then is, should regulators require that licensed virtual currency firms only use public ledgers? And then an associated question is what to do about so-called tumblers, which are of particular concern to law enforcement. Tumblers are a technology used to obscure the record and source of virtual currency transactions. Understandably, that's a prospect we heard at the hearings that gives pause to those officials uh, who are charged with enforcing laws against money laundering. But other panelists contended that tumblers could potentially have legitimate uses, such as keeping the financial information of a lawful merchant that accepts virtual currencies private from their competitors. Given all that, should the use of tumblers be banned or restricted, or at least disclosed? That's a difficult question that we're wrestling with at DFS right now, and we're interested to hear from all sides as we do that wrestling. Another issue we're grappling with is uh, for what points of entry in the virtual currency ecosystem regulators should provide oversight. In other words, what types of firms and transactions sh should we regulate? Miners are obviously a vital part of the ecosystem, but some regulators have determined that they do not meet the threshold for proactive oversight. 
It would also seem difficult to impossible, for instance, for financial regulators to provide oversight of every single individual peer-to-peer -peer transaction unless there is evidence of specific, specific criminal or civil wrongdoing. We do not, for instance, require policing of every single individual transaction involving cash. But should we, as some suggest, only regulate transactions where virtual currencies are exchanged for dollars and other traditional fiat currencies? Given the gradual but accelerating growth of virtual currencies in online and brick and mortar transactions, as well as other less legitimate enterprises, that could leave a gaping loophole for misconduct if this technology gains wider adoption. Indeed, law enforcement officials at our hearing noted the capacity of virtual currency to really scale up money laundering in a way that is not necessarily possible with physical cash. When it comes to using phys physical cash for legal activity, criminals are constrained in certain respects to what they can physically carry and transport. There are no such limitations when it comes to virtual currencies. This is not to say that our goal is to unduly single out virtual currency. Let's be frank. A lot more money has been laundered through large banks than has been laundered through virtual currency. If you look at our history at DFS, you'll see that's something about which we are acutely aware and are working aggressively to combat. More broadly, it's simply the responsibility of regulators to be cognizant of the new and emerging risks that virtual currencies present for illicit conduct and to try and find ways to mitigate them. Now, there are many other issues we're considering as part of our regulatory inquiry, such as the specific licensing and examination requirements for virtual currency firms, or whether there should be a regulatory safe harbor through which virtual currency firms, assuming they have met certain basic uh, anti-money laundering and consumer protection requirements, can notify their regulators and keep operating during a licensing process. And that was an intriguing idea raised uh, during the hearings. But we have a limited amount of time today, and I wanted to provide just a flavor of some of the things we're thinking about. Indeed, I think it's clear that 2014 is going to be a critical year for the future of virtual currencies, and it's feeling more and more like that every day. We are at a bit of a crossroads regarding whether virtual currencies will become an important part of the future of our financial system or primarily a tool for illicit activity. At this stage in our inquiry, regulators have been accused by some of having more questions than answers. I actually think that's healthy particularly if we're going to be true to our stated goal of proceeding without prejudgments. We're committed to proceeding thoughtfully, since virtual currencies could ultimately have a number of benefits, a number of very exciting benefits for our financial system. It could, for example, force the traditional payments community to up its game in terms of the speed, affordability, and reliability of financial transactions. I think many consumers, myself included, are mystified that in a world where information travels around the globe in a matter of milliseconds, it can often take several days to transfer money to a friend's bank account. To use a personal example, I can tell you I have a credit card with a particular bank, and I also have my bank account at that same bank. And once a month, I pay my credit card bill by transferring money from that bank to that bank <laughs> to pay the bill. But nevertheless, it takes several days for that payment to go through. Now, to be fair, I, uh, after I said that at the hearings, came up randomly at the hearings, uh, I got a call from someone I will not name, but he's a very big deal CEO at a very big deal bank who said that, it, he said, he called me and said, I want your business because at my bank that doesn't happen and <laughs> it transfers right away. So um, not all banks are that slow, I'm told. So I think it's fair to say, obviously, there's room for additional innovation um, in the financial world and payments technology, and we want to be careful to get the balance right. Um, I think banks are certainly taking notice of what's going on in the Bitcoin world, and a race to the top to do better when it comes to payments and financial technologies can only be a good thing, in my opinion. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I'd be happy to take uh, questions until they kick me off the stage. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one question, then we're going to open up the audience. And my question is simply that um, before you, you talked about at the hearing and also today about issuing guidance in, in 2014, before you actually issue that, do you plan on uh, offering it for public comment, or do you expect that it'll just be issued uh, without the, that opportunity first? 
Yeah, so whenever we do, a, can you guys hear me okay? Whenever we do a regulation, uh, it goes out for public comment, unless it's an emergency regulation. I can't promise, but I, my gut is I doubt that we would do this as an emergency reg. Um, and I think we're actually going to try and be even more transparent. As I said, we want to make this sort of open source, uh, hello, open source code uh, regulation where we'll really um, you know, get more input than we normally would even before we put the proposal out. It's one of the purposes of coming to speak with you all today. And we are getting, I can say it's, for whatever reason, the Bitcoin world, we're getting a lot of feedback, uh, particularly over things like uh, Twitter, where um, a lot of people have opinions and they're sending us their thoughts. So um, it'll be sort of very robust um, information coming in. Great. Okay, so we have uh, some time for questions, if uh, people have some. So question back there. Hi, Jim Harper with the Cato Institute. I heard you say, but I didn't gather well, um, what the differences are between financial services provided in conventional ways and financial services provided using Bitcoin or other digital currencies. Could you review again uh, how those are different? Sure. So um, I, I think what you're referring to, as I was saying, are regs that currently exist for money transmission are not that easily adaptable to uh, virtual currencies. They were, as I mentioned, uh, you know, written well over 100 years ago, many of them. Um, they do not contemplate whatsoever um, the kinds of uh, anonymity, for example, that virtual currencies or pseudonymity that virtual currencies provide. Uh, they certainly don't contemplate the speed with which you can do international transactions. Uh, they don't think about the, the regs are not well suited to um, really just the whole virtual currency system. And the more we've looked at it, um, take for example the permissible investment requirements. Um, the more we've looked at it, they've always, uh, they're all designed to be fiat currency. But if you require that of virtual currency firms, for example, um, where uh, the value of Bitcoin is spiking up and down um, lately on a daily basis, but certainly uh, quite often. Um, it gets very hard to say to a virtual currency firm potentially that the permissible investments should all be thought of um, in dollars. So those are all sort of different ways in which we think we're going to have to um, uh, m adapt our licensing requirements and make them more modern. Um, look, I think it's something we should be doing more broadly as financial regulators in general. It's not just with virtual currencies, it's with mobile payments, uh, payment systems in general. There have been so many developments over the last 20 years, I think, because of technology. And the more we can do to have our uh, r regulatory frameworks keep pace and make sense uh, with that modern world, um, I think that's for the better. Okay, I think Kashmir Hill here had a question up front. And th this, is, this is probably the, the last question, I think, oh, before sorry. we... Uh, I'm Kashmir Hill. I write about Bitcoin for Forbes. I was just wondering who, uh, who will be required to have these, these bit licenses? Um, is it kind of any, any company that gets involved in Bitcoin is kind of inherently involved in money transmission? So I'm just curious how, how big the, the universe of licensing is going to be. Yeah, look, I think that's one of the um, questions we're wrestling with is what point of entry do you make in the ecosystem to decide? Um, I think certainly exchanges um, are going to be at the heart of it, and FinCEN has already gone there, uh, which was great and very, I think, helpful in a way that that definiteness was put out there. I think as you broaden out from that, the question is who gets included in that regulatory circle and who doesn't, and I don't think we've made that uh, determination yet. I think it's a, it's a tricky question, and as I implied um, in, in the talk, uh, if it's if you're only if it's too narrow, you may not be taking into account some of the unique characteristics of virtual currencies, and you may be leaving out some important firms. So, but we're still working on that. Okay, so we've got time for one more very brief question. And I think we saw all the way in the back. I see somebody's got a got a hand up there.
Hi, my name is um, Andrew McCarrick. I'm from Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. I was wondering, you mentioned, and other panelists have also mentioned, that a lot of these exchanges are moving offshore. Uh, do you, as a state regulator, um, are th is there any reach that you have uh, to enforce actions against those organizations? And also, um, is there any regulatory risk um, in terms of less visibility or um, less ability to enforce that you would see if uh, this offshoring trend continues? It's a very good question. Did you say you're from the FDIC? I have questions for you. When and, 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 and you've only got 60 seconds to answer. Is that uh, 60 that? seconds. No, the, um, look, I think offshoring is something we really worry about. And although I think we take an expansive view of our jurisdiction at DFS, I think it's hard for us to do much um, offshore. Um, it's hard enough to go out of New York. And, um, I, but look, I think we're hoping that if you create a, a smart regulatory scheme and you coordinate with uh, federal counterparts and other regulators, including state regu other state regulators and CSBS, um, and you create a smart scheme, the idea is to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the, the good firms who want to do this the right way, uh, as opposed to those who want to do it in the illicit way, uh, will hopefully succeed. But as you separate the wheat from the chaff, the key is you don't want to drive large segments of the industry further offshore. That ends up being uh, counterproductive. So that is going to be the challenge as we do these regulations. We want to actually, I'm hoping, will make New York an attractive place for those who want to do this the right way, for those who want to uh, create all the benefits, potential benefits of virtual currency without having the money laundering. We want to attract them, frankly, to New York and have New York be a place where these exchanges are hubbed. So, um, but we certainly worry all the time about the unintended consequences of all of our regulations. And here, certainly with a nascent industry, you want to keep it from going offshore where it's even harder to regulate. Okay, well, let's thank Mr. Losky for a really interesting presentation.